Hi guys, I'm Dr. Pavan and in this session we are going to talk about the urinary symptoms and investigation. So this is basically the first chapter of your urology in your love and belly. I think it's a very very important chapter because uh, there are many questions which can be asked from this and they are kind of like many things are given in this particular chapter. Let's try to kind of summarize it. And this is something which is like often missed by students. They usually kind of do not miss like they miss this and they straight away start with like the kidney and all. So this is an important kind of a session. Please pay attention. Now, the first thing, let's talk about the pain. So, yeah, when the patient comes to you, the patient might come to you with pain. And if at all the patient comes to you with the pain, you need to understand that what kind of pain is there. Because depending on the characteristic of that particular pain, you might be able to understand a bit about what's wrong with that particular patient. So patient might complain of dysuria. Now, what do you understand by dysuria? The patient will say that, you know what, I have a difficulty in urination or I have let's say burning during urination okay so that is what is your dysuria so that is basically pain while passing urine or burning or like difficulty while passing urine now if at all the patient says that there can be one most important reason for that is infection obviously if at all the patient is having a urinary tract infection the patient might have dysuria now another very important okay so it's like more important than urinary tract infection is carcinoma in situ now you do understand the cis of the urinary bladder it may present to you with irritative symptoms. So that is a very, very important point, okay? So they might ask you, what is a, like a bladder carcinoma which may present with an irritative symptoms? The answer to that is CIS, carcinoma in situ of the urinary bladder, okay? So that is about the dysuria. Now the patient may come to you with a renal or a uretric colic. So if at all the stone is present in the kidney, the patient might have a dull aching pain in the flanks and all those particular things. But if at all there is a stone in the ureter, the patient will have a colicky type of a pain. And you all know what is a colicky type of pain, that the pain increases in kind of intensity and then it dies down. So that, you know, increase in the intensity and the dying down of that particular pain intermittently, that is what is called as a colicky type of a pain. I hope you have understood this particular point. So yeah, that is what is a uretric stone. This is how it can present to you. Can you think of any particular thing where the stone is not present in the ureter, but the, still the patient might have a colicky type of a pain? Can you think of any kind of condition? So let's assume that there was a bleeding. The bleeding, the source of the bleeding was the kidney. The blood was coming down, 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 and some amount of the blood clotted in the ureter. If at all this kind of happens, then what can happen? That clotted blood in the ureter can also this be responsible for this colicky type of a pain. And that is what we call as a clot colicky. Okay, so please understand this. So blood clots, yes, they can also lead to this colicky type of pain. And then slough renal papillae. So in the patients with the diabetes mellitus. Okay, so what is the what are the patients or what are the conditions where the renal papilla can get sloughed off? The most like important kind of thing. Let's say if you talk about India, then okay, tuberculosis can be considered. But the other way, like, you know, diabetes mellitus and the sickle cell. Okay, so all these are the kind of a conditions where the papilla can sloughed off. So the colicky type of pain, the most common reason obviously is a uretric stone. Another reasons can be the blood clot or the sloughed renal papilla. Okay, now infection or the inflammation of the bladder. So if at all there is an infection or the inflammation of the bladder, patient might have a suprapubic pain. So patient might say that, you know what, I have a pain in the suprapubic region. That's fine. Now, if at all the patient says that, you know what, I have a pain which increases in intensity as my bladder is filling up. And once I go and void in the washroom, my pain basically goes away. So the suprapubic pain when the bladder is full, which is relieved on maturation, that is what is a characteristic feature of an interstitial cystitis. Very, very important. It is much more common in the females as compared to the other males. And do not forget this, a characteristic pain where the pain increases in intensity as the bladder is filling up and once the patient goes to the washroom and voids, the pain basically goes down. That is what is a giveaway point for your interstitial cystitis. Now the testes, obviously there can be a testicular pain if at all there is an epididymal orchitis and the torsion. What is a friend sign? Friend sign is a condition where you distinguish between the epididymal orchitis and the torsion. You go to the patient and you lift the testes, if at all the pain reduces, the answer is Epidemiorchitis. If the pain kind of increases, the answer is testicular torsion. So, friend's sign is a sign to distinguish between these two conditions. It's very, very important. Obviously, the pain can occur some amount in the hydrocele and the varicocele also. That's fine. So, yeah, this is how the testicular pain may present. Other places are like torsion of the hydrative morgagni. Yeah, that is again one of the conditions where the testes may be painful. We'll talk about it. Okay. Now, post vasectomy, the pain can be there. Now, what you need to understand is just after the uh, like uh, vasectomy, okay? So, there is 10% of the risk of the testicular pain in the short term. Let's say the patient got operated today after 1, 2, 3 weeks, 4 weeks, the patient might come to you and around 10% of the patient might have pain. But over the long period of time, 
only 1% of the patients might have a chronic testicular pain. Now, there are a lot of hypotheses behind this. Some say that, you know what, because of the, you know, the, the sperms are not able to kind of go out and that's why there is a chronic kind of pain. There are various, various pathogenesis for that. But what you need to understand is that, yes, post varicoselectomy, pain can be there. It is much more in the acute period that 10% of the patients might have it, but over the long run, only 1% of the patients might have it, okay? Now, coming to the LUTs, okay, so there can be lower urinary tract symptoms. They can be either the storage symptoms or there can be voiding symptoms. What are the storage symptoms? The patient will complain of frequency that he will say that, you know what, I have to go again and again to the washroom. That's fine. Now, normally, we kind of wait around two and a half, three years before going to the washroom, three to four years. But if at all, let's say the patient has to go every half an hour or one hour or something, or maybe the patient has to go every one and a half hours. So, if at all the patients say that I have to go every 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, probably the patient is in the overflow dribbling. But if at all the patient is, let's say, saying going after one hour and a half hours, then probably the patient is having BPH or some obstructive, like bladder outlet obstruction or something like that. Might not have understood what I've said in like one last one sentence, but don't worry, I'll make you understand. Now, what do you understand by overflow dribbling? Okay, overflow dribbling is basically we have some limited amount of the capacity into the bladder. Now, the kidneys are continuously producing the urine. Once the urine comes down, it kind of starts to fill inside the bladder and there is a capacity to which the bladder kind of can hold the urine. Okay, now the function of the bladder, the main function of the bladder is to hold the urine. The secondary function of the bladder is to take the urine out. In order to take the urine out, the detrusor muscle needs to contract. Now, if at all there is a patient with a spinal cord injury or if at all there is a patient with a neurogenic bladder as in diabetes what is going to happen the capacity of the detrusor muscles to contract is going to go down or rather it's going to be zero and if at all the capacity of the detrusor muscles to contract is zero then what is going to happen the patient will have to apply the abdominal pressure or if at all he doesn't apply any pressure whenever the urine is coming out from above that is going to push the urine inside the bladder and some amount of the urine might come out so even if the bladder is having, let's say, 1 liter or 1.1 liters of the urine, only 15 ml, 30 ml, 50 ml will come out, depending on how much amount of the abdominal pressure or the external pressure is applied. Am I making some sense to you? This is what is called as an overflow dribbling. Another name for this particular condition is paradoxical incontinence. Are you able to understand this point? The overflow dribbling or the paradoxical incontinence is the one which is occurring in the patients with a neurogenic bladder where the bladder is overfilled and there is no more capacity and that is why some amount of the urine is coming out. But patient will not tell you all these things. What will patient tell you? Patient will tell you that, you know what doctor, I have to go to the washroom every 15 to 20 minutes and every time I go, only around 15, 20, 50, 30 ml comes out. And you'll ask the patient, do you have the sensation of the urine going to the washroom? He'll say, no, I never have the sensation. Why? Because it's a neurogenic bladder. There is no sensation. The patient is not having a painful retention. It's a painless retention, painless chronic retention of the urine. I hope I have made some sense whatever I was trying to convey over here. Okay. So yeah, that's about the, that is how the frequency can help you. Like how much is the frequency and whether the frequency is present or not. That is how it can help you. Okay, it was a bit deep, but I hope you have understood. No nocturia, like how many times the patient has to get up, less than one is fine, more than one or two times is something which kind of worrisome. But yeah, like you have to kind of, this is again a storage symptom. Then urgency and the urgent continence. What, do you, what is urgency? What is urgent continence? Let's say I'm kind of taking the lecture and if at all I have a sensation of passing the urine, I can wait like for half an hour, one hour. That is, I don't have an urgency. Let's say if at all, I cannot wait. I have to pause this particular recording and I have to go to the washroom. And if at all, before reaching to the washroom, some amount of the urine leaks out. That is what is called as the urge incontinence. So urgency means the sensation to go immediately to the washroom. That is what is an urgency. Urge incontinence is when, when you are not able to even control the urine. Like before reaching to the washroom, you pass the urine out. So that is the difference between urgency and urge incontinence. These are the storage symptoms. Then voiding symptoms are hesitancy, reduced stream and the straining. Hesitancy means when you go to the washroom, you take some time for the urine flow to start. That is hesitancy. What is reduced stream? The flow of the urine, the you know the girth of the kind of the flow is a bit reduced. So you will say that okay, the patient will tell you that my flow is poor. That's what they will tell you. And the straining, like they have to kind of apply pressure in order to pass the urine. So that is all about it. Now, post micturation large, so there can be incomplete voiding and the post micturation dribbling. So, the patient may say that, you know what, like after passing the urine, I'm not satisfied. I feel that the urine is still remaining inside my bladder. That is what they call it as the incomplete evacuation of the bladder. So, they have a feeling of an incomplete emptying of the bladder. That's what you need to understand. And then post micturation dribbling, yeah, that can happen in some patients. That's fine. Now, let's talk about the storage LUTs. It's overactive bladder. 
and the voiding LUTs is a bladder op outlet obstruction. So storage LUTs are more common in the what you call it is overactive bladder when the detrusor is kind of contracting again and again and again. So that is when you are going to have the frequency and the urgency and the urgent continence. But if at all, let's say you are having the poor flow hesitancy and all those things, they are the features of your bladder outlet obstruction. Okay. So these two slides were just the names, but it is going to tell you a lot. Like when you kind of read urology in a bit more detail, you will understand the significance of each of these particular symptoms. I hope you have understood at least a bit. Now coming to a simple one-liner, they might ask you that after doing a TURP, which symptom of the patient may not get corrected. So it is post void dribbling. Post void dribbling might continue, but it's fine. It's nothing kind of a big deal about it. It's absolutely fine. Now, let's talk about the hematuria. Hematuria means the blood in the urine. Now, the blood in the urine, it can be either a gross hematuria or it can be a microscopic hematuria. What do you understand by gross hematuria? That when the patient is passing the urine, you are able to see the red urine coming out. That is, with your naked eye, if you're able to see, that is what is a gross maturia. Microscopic maturia, on just the physical appearance, you feel that, okay, the urine is absolutely fine. But when you look at it under the microscope, you see that, you know what, there are more than three RBCs per high power field, okay? So, yeah, that is what is a microscopic maturia. More than three RBCs per high power field, that is what is a microscopic maturia. That is what you need to understand, okay? So, microscopic is invisible microscopic is under the microscope now what are the causes of the hematuria okay one of the most important cause of hematuria which we are worried about is the neoplasia so cancer what is the most common cancer which presents as a hematuria bladder cancer urinary bladder cancer but hematuria can occur either in the transitional cell carcinoma of the upper urinary tract or a renal cell carcinoma, all these cancers can also present to you with the hematuria sometimes even prosthetic cancer but it's quite rare one cancer which you will think of if at all you have a gross hematuria is either the bladder carcinoma or a transitional cell carcinoma of the upper urinary tract. The second possibility would be the renal cell carcinoma. Understood? Now, the infection, yeah, there can be some amount of the hemorrhage and the trauma, obviously, after the trauma, there can be bleeding. Okay? So, these are the causes of the hematuria. Now, chances of the detection of the malignancy is directly dependent on the degree of hematuria. Now, this is something which is important. Now, let's say if at all the patient is having a microscopic hematuria with respect to the patient who is having a macroscopic hematuria, you need to understand two things. Can the microscopic and the macroscopic hematuria tell you whether the injury, so let's say we are talking about the patient with the trauma, the urological trauma. Can a microscopic and macroscopic hematuria tell you that, okay, there is a, this is a patient who is having a microscopic hematuria, probably the injury is not very severe, and this is a patient who is having a macroscopic hematuria, the injury in this particular patient is severe. Can this be said? The answer is no, not at all. So the degree of hematuria doesn't tell you the severity of the trauma. But when we talk about the malignant, the degree of hematuria is directly proportional to the chance of the malignancy. This is very, very important. I hope you have understood this particular point, guys. Okay. So the degree of hematuria, in other words, if at all the patient is having a gross hematuria, the chances of you finding a malignancy in that particular patient is higher. 20% of the patients. Okay. So 20% of the patients will have some or the other malignancy if at all the patient has a gross hematuria. When we talk about the microscopic hematuria, 5% of the patients might have some or the other malignancy. I hope I have made my point in the trauma. The degree of hematuria is not kind of correlated, but in the malignancy, yes, it is kind of correlated. Now, yes, we talked about the red urine, but just by looking at the urine, you cannot say whether it's a blood only because there are various other things which may mimic the hematuria. So what are these particular things? So you can have a hemoglobin urea or you can have a myoglobin urea. All these, all those particular things will have a red urine. Okay. Now in the patients with the porphyria, okay, in the patients with the porphyria, they will also have a red urine, but the difference would be if you allow the urine from a patient of a porphyria to just kind of lie down in the back and if at all it is exposed to the sunlight what is going to happen the color of that particular urine is going to get converted to the brown or the purple color okay so if at all they tell you that you know what the patient had a bleeding and that particular euro bag it basically turned into the purple color like the urine in the euro bag turned into the purple color or the brown color the answer is the patient is suffering from porphyria Okay, now there are certain drugs like the patients can be on certain medications which are causing the discoloration of the urine. So always take the history of the drugs, let's say the rifampicin, isoniazide and the uh, phenoxypyridine. Okay, so these are the three drugs which may cause the reddish or the orange discoloration of the urine. Okay, so rifampicin, isoniazide and the uh, pyridine. Okay, so phenoxypyridine. So these are the drugs which may cause the orange discoloration of the urine. Now beetroot, that is beta-catenin, they can cause again the discoloration of the urine. So beetroot can again cause the red coloration of the urine. So that is something which you need to understand. 
the nitrofurantoin and metronidazole that can cause the brown discoloration of the urine okay important one liner can be as nitrofurantoin and metronidazole can cause the brown discoloration of the urine so yes hematuria is important but you have to kind of be vigilant about the other things also practically you might definitely like phenoxyparidine whenever you give the patient develops the red urine yeah the orange urine the patient develops definitely but yeah like these are the things which you need to kind of remember at least for the mcq point of view okay now coming to the symptoms related to the external genitalia okay now there's something which is called as a torsion of hydrated of morgagni so there's something which is called as an appendix of the testes so as you can see over here this is what is hydrated of morgagni or an appendix of testes what do you wish to call it so this is basically a remnant of the mullerian duct okay so embryologically it is a remnant of a mullerian duct it is basically an vestigial kind of a thing around the testes now it can get twisted sometimes and as i have already mentioned you this is what is called as a torsion of hydrated of morgagni okay now this may again come to you with a pain like uh, the testicular pain okay now how do you distinguish so when you kind of do a physical examination in this particular patient what are you going to find you are going to find something which is called as a blue dot sign now, what is this blue dot sign so here what you are finding is that the skin is absolutely fine but just behind the skin you are able to appreciate this blue dot this blue dot is nothing it is basically the necrosed hydrated of morgagni so you are able to see that through the skin and that is what is called as the blue dot sign and that is what is the characteristic of torsion of hydrated of morgagni very very important did you understand this particular point okay now the difference between this and testicular torsion is testicular torsion is an emergency torsion of the hydrated of morgagni is managed conservatively you just give any sedatives and the painkillers and the patient will be fine so this is how the clinical examination might help you in saving that particular surgery now kleine felter syndrome if at all the patient is having that and the patient is coming to you with a puberty with the not appearing of the secondary sexual characters and all those particular things on examination if you find the small and the firm testes usually the testes are not very very firm so if at all you have the small bilaterally if you have a small and the firm testes then yeah probably the patient is having the kleine felter syndrome now hydrocele and the epidermal cyst okay you will be able to palpate it very very easily but yeah like when you put a torch light you might find a trans illumination okay on the clinical examination nothing great about this but yeah that's fine peronis disease now what is a peronis disease here there is a formation of a plaque at that unique albuginia and because of this fibrous plaque there is a curvature of the penis so on examination on the erect position you will have the curvature of the penis and on the flaccid position when you try to palpate you might palpate the plaque so please understand the plaque is kind of felt better in the flaccid kind of condition but the curvature obviously that is kind of better appreciated in the erect condition now penile fracture okay this can happen what is the penile fracture there is a breach in the tunica albuginea and what are you basically seeing over here this is what is a eggplant deformity please remember this important image eggplant deformity or the brinjal shaped deformity this occurs when the bucks fascia is kind of intact and i hope you are able to appreciate there is a kind of a breach in the kind of a tunica albuginea and yeah you kind of repair it with a non absorbable suture you it's a surgical emergency you repair it with a non absorbable suture now this is an important image it is a coronal papilla this has already been asked in the neat pg exam once so it is a benign condition of the penis nothing to be worried about i'm sure that you guys would have encountered this at one point or the other in your opd so yeah this is what is a coronal papilla completely benign condition nothing to be done in these particular patients balanite is zero to completeness now this is what is a pre malignant condition for the penile carcinoma okay so if it told you if it told the patient has this bxo okay how will you appreciate that this is a bxo so this is a fibrous kind of a thing so this it is having a less white but so many times you have a very very dense white kind of a thing in the prepucial area so this is what is a bxo okay so dense white kind of a thing near the prepucial area that is what is a bxo in yeah this is how you kind of diagnose it right okay now coming to the genital warts and what happens in the genital warts it's a condyloma acuminata okay so you have a like a warty kind of a lesion on the penis just can understand this is what is the genital warts hpv infection yeah it's again like kind of a thing pre malignant condition okay so it's a hpv associated pre malignant condition so these are the important images which i wish to show you on the clinical examination subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from prep ladder